Okay, uh, before we, uh, before I start with the message, uh, let me ask you a question. And if you know the answer, you can give the answer. If not, you would know the answer. Um, just one question. Who invented the dynamite? <laughs> Okay, yeah, let me tell you who invented the dynamite. Alfred Nobel. And he says Swedish. And if you pronounce it correctly, Alfred Nobel. That's how his name was pronounced. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite and one of the wealthiest men of his day, woke up one morning in 1888 and read his own obituary. The obituary was printed by mistake. It was Alfred's brother who had died by the name of Ludwig. <laughs> and a French reporter carelessly reported the death of her own brother. I remember when I was uh, in my, not actually in my teens, but when my, when my brother of 29 years old died, in our town it was reported that it was me who died. <laughs> I remember that. He, he's he's, he's uh, two years older than me, and when my relatives saw me, oh, Johnny, it was you who died. I was so shocked because yeah, I do not know what, why, why it happened, but I can relate to this. Uh, most of my relatives then were so shocked to see me alive because they thought it was me who died. <laughs> and I believe any one of us would have been disturbed to read our own obituary while we were still alive. But to Alfred, the shock was so overwhelming because he got to see himself as the world saw him. The dynamite king. The weapon maker, the great industrialist who had made an immense fortune from explosives. You see, being an inventor of dynamite, it actually made him a millionaire during his time. He is also known as a cannon maker, and during his death, he actually had 350 patents at the time of his death, and 90 armaments factories. So that, that was how Alfred Nobel was reached. From what he read in the paper, he realized that this was how the general public saw him. Someone whose entire purpose in life was to bring about greater and greater destruction through war. In the newspaper, the obituary stated, and let me quote it in French, let me borrow from uh, Dr. Sheehan. The Merchant de la Mort, the Esmond. <laughs> Let me read it again. The Merchant de la Mort, Esmond. Which means, the merchant of death is dead. That's how the general public saw Alfred Nobel at his time. The merchant of death. Nobel was so shattered in the state that so he resolved to do something about it. His real passion, which few people knew about, was to encourage people and encourage ideas that would benefit the human race. So he made a plan, he changed his will. He determined that his last will and testament would be the true expression of who he was. And as a result, the most value of all prizes given to this day to individuals who have done the most for the cause of world peace and discoveries that benefit the human race came from the Nobel Prizes. And the most famous of which is the Nobel Peace Prize. Few people today remember that Alfred Nobel invented the dynamite. That's the reason why I asked you at first who invented the dynamite. So no one remembered that it was Alfred Nobel. But everybody is familiar with the legacy he's left through the disposition of his last will and testament. That's 
than something that just happened. That was something that was planned for and intentional. That a literary caused you to aim for something and get it. As a Christian, what are you aiming for? What are you aiming for? What is the legacy you want to leave to the generations that come after you? How will those you know and love you say you've influenced their lives? Will the fruit you leave behind have lasting value? Let me tell you what's the meaning of legacy. What is legacy? A legacy is what you leave with the people you're closest to after you're gone. It's what lives on after you die. How will you be remembered? It's the impact you made in this life while you were here in this world. I'll tell you, everyone leaves a legacy. The question is not if you will leave a legacy, because everyone will. The question is what kind of legacy you're going to leave. Let's take a, 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 a character from the Bible, from the New Testament. The Apostle Paul expressed his passion to know Christ. That was the main goal of Apostle Paul. His desire to know more Christ in his life. There is no doubt that intimately knowing Jesus Christ was Paul's number one goal in life. Paul had an unquenchable desire to know Christ in his life. And he had what we call an unstoppable determination to follow Christ. For him, the ultimate aim in his life was to fully follow Jesus. What a novel aim for a possible Paul. And by calling ourselves Christians, we should be the goal of our lives as well as Jesus Christ called the first disciples to follow me. And it's the same thing he does with each of us in the same prayer today. We are to follow Jesus Christ. But how do we fully follow Jesus? As our life goes along, we're going to come to a lot of forks in the road. We do not know which way to go. We do not know which way we go to the left. Of the writers, a lot of forms that we will encounter in our lives. How do we follow Jesus so that the power of Jesus Christ and the urgency of His great mission do not gradually deal in our lives? And the thesis for our message today is that leaving a legacy that's worth something is eternal significance. And I would like to request. All of you to please stand with us and read our verse 14 text, which is found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. There are only four verses, so I request everyone read the verses at the same time. Verse 16. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Christ. And what do we have as followers? 
of Jesus Christ. You see, the word live up to calls for Christians to maintain a consistent life in harmony with understanding of God's truth they already have. So, just who are we and what do we have? So, let, let us have at least some of them. Because if we're going to, to uh, discuss all of them, there's a lot. So, let's discuss some of them. First one is, we are forgiven and forgotten. Forgiven and forgotten. All of us are forgiven and forgotten. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what did He do to our sins? He forgave us from all our sins around the weeks. And for, by forgiving our sins, He gave us the right to stand before the holy, perfect, and completely righteous God. Because we are forgiven by God. But not only does He forgive our sins, He also forgets our sins. He remembers them no more. That's how our God loves us. He forgives and forgets our sins. Many of us have heard his name. He is a Holocaust survivor. Or she is a Holocaust survivor. Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom in one of his books said, It's like God takes your sin, dumps it into the deepest part of the ocean, and then hangs out a sign that says, No fishing allowed. That's true. That's what Corey Kendall uh, looked at how God forgives and forgets our sin. So this is something wonderful. You see, we know that we're a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. But I'm saved by grace. Amen. And all of us, we're sinners before, but we are saved by grace. And I, I, I was guilty of breaking God's laws. And we all are. So what we want is mercy not justice for our sin. And that's what you and I receive as Christians. God's mercy to forgive our sins. That's a very pre pre precious possession that we have. The second one, we have a new birth. New birth. We've been given new birth. Because of this new birth, you are now part of God's family. You become a child of God. The God of the universe is now your father and you are his son or daughter. You and I are now royalty. That is something to be. We, we should be proud of that. Because we were adopted by God. So don't live like a loser. Live like a winner. Not a whiner. Live like a winner. Live like a victor. Because uh, our Father in heaven is the awesome one. So we should be living like a victor, like a winner. We are children of the King. So therefore, if we are children of the King, who are we? We should be princesses and prince. Right? Because our Father is the King. It's as if you were a beggar on the street, homeless and without a future, and suddenly you are adopted by the king and made a prince or a princess. That's something that is ours, and no one can take away that from us. The third one is that Holy Spirit guides and teaches us. Before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he told us that he would send the Holy Spirit to teach us all things and to guide us into the truth. Jesus said, I will send you what? A helper. Parapletos. A paraclete. So we have a guide for life. He's always with us. He points the way. He comforts us. And He encourages us. And because we have the Holy Spirit to guide us, we are given insight into God's Word. Sometimes we cannot, see, we, we cannot really understand God's Word. But, but because we have the Holy Spirit within us, it gives us the knowledge of His Word. The Bible teaches that those who do not know Christ 
are blind to spiritual truths. But as Christians, our eyes are open. The Holy Spirit is our, we call that, spiritual vice. Because it makes our eyes clear. Or if you're not, if you're not uh, familiar with the vice, our spiritual I know. <laughs> if you're familiar with that. Okay. He opens our eyes to see clearly what the Word of God means to our individual life situations. We can read and understand God's written word because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. That's who we are. We have the Holy Spirit within us. The fourth one is that God's love given to us. Remember Brother Manny's message last week. Love comes from God. And because of this love from God, we're able to love others. Show our love to others. We have the capacity to love one another unselfishly because, because we have the love of God within us. We can now love one another with a God kind of love. The Greek word for this love is agape. And this is not an ordinary love. This is a supernatural love because we are the recipients of God's love. We are now free to love others unconditionally. The fifth one, we can stand in God's promises. If you look at the Bible, there are how many promises in the Bible? Another trivial question. Okay? If you cannot give me the answer, I won't give you the answer. <laughs> there are lots of promises in the Bible, and we can stand on the promises of God in the Bible. Because we know that when God promised, what will happen to His promise? Yeah, it will happen. It's true. We can live by those promises. And we can base our lives in those promises. Number six, or letter F. Jesus is our advocate. What's the meaning of advocate? Okay. In other words, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the throne of God making intercession for us. He's there pleading our case. Satan is called what? The accuser of the brethren in the Bible. Satan keeps on accusing us. And who is our advocate? Who is our attorney? Who is our avogado? Jesus. Okay. He's a defense authority for Christians. When Satan accuses us before God, Jesus excuses us based on the fact that he has already paid for our sins with the price of his blood. Our divine attorney, who is the son of judge. Remember? Our God is the judge, God the Father. And he's our attorney, the son of the judge. That's Jesus. That's something that's ours. And letter uh, G, we have spiritual weapons found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And we need these weapons to defeat our enemy and accuser, Satan. The Bible teaches that we have been given everything we need for life and godliness. In the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us that we've been given a spiritual armor to withstand demonic attacks. We've been given the weapons to defeat the enemy. And, and, and for the last, we have a home in heaven. Are you glad about that? That uh, we have a temporary home in this place which we call earth, but we have an eternal home in heaven. For Jesus said, in my Father's house are many, some translated mansions, some translated rooms. Our eternal destiny is certain. Our future is secure. One day we will see Jesus and we will be with Him forever. Heaven will be a place of eternal joy. There will be no suffering. There will be no sorrow. There will be no sickness or death. No pain or regrets. And what a wonderful hope we have. Brothers and sisters, when Paul says that we should live up to what we have already attained, we need to understand that we have attained a tremendous amount through Christ Jesus. We have a lot already through Christ Jesus. We need to understand just who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. And not only that, 
live like Him. As Christians, we should never live as losers but as victors. We should never see ourselves as a separate entity that is apart from Christ. We are joined with Him, and because of that, we must live up to who we are and what we have. Doing that will help us live a life and live a legacy that's worth something. And the second point is found in the next verse, verse 17. Follow those who follow Christ. Verse 17, Apostle Paul said, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Now, Paul set himself as an example for all the groups and individuals he up and worked with to follow. He said the identical thing in the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, or 11, verse 1, he says, follow my example as I follow Christ. Now, let, let, me, let me explain this further, verse 17. In verse 17, in the early years of the church, believers needed practical guides for conduct. So Paul urged the Philippians to join him together in imitating his conduct. Now, you, you, you might be asking, do you think Paul really had had the authority or the key to, to tell that to, to other believers that follow me as I follow Christ or imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because we know that Paul was, wasn't perfect and he never claimed to be perfect. But he was someone who was giving his all to follow Christ. He worked hard at setting an example. Furthermore, Paul here includes others in this model by urging his readers to take note of those who were living in conformity, conformity with the pattern we gave you. So Paul was actually not very egotistical when he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Because he said, the pattern we gave you. So that means Paul includes not only himself, but probably Timothy, who is much younger than Paul and perhaps Epaphroditus. So therefore, he was not claiming any superiority. You and I need to look to others who are sincerely following Jesus Christ and imitate their lives so that our enthusiasm in serving the Lord will not diminish. If you were in the Bible study last Friday, it talks about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. And sometimes we are so enthusiastic in our service to the Lord, but there were times that we are not as enthusiastic in our service to the Lord. That was a very good um, um, Bible study last Friday, and you missed that for those who were not able to, to, to attend. Well, we can see in our church who to follow as an example. For example, if you're a younger, a younger and not an elder, you need to seek out someone in this church who is a couple of steps ahead of you in the faith and learn from them. The question is, how do we follow others? One, or letter A, you follow others by intentionally spending time with someone you respect. If you have someone in this church, or if you have someone who is a Christian that you want to, to you respect a lot, spend some time with them. Because the more you spend time with someone you respect, the more you will imitate his ways. Yes or no? Yes. Because you respect the person, you want to be the person a lot of times, you will not um, pray. You will not notice that you are imitating his ways already because of your high respect on that person. Second, looking for opportunities, opportunities to talk with someone who is more experienced in the faith than you do. Why? Because you will learn from them. And there see, asking questions of persons you respect about following God. And then follow their example. 
That's how we follow others. To spend time in, intentionally looking for opportunities to talk with someone and asking questions of persons you respect about following God. Learn from them. Christianity is personal. That's true. You cannot be saved just because, oh, my parents are a Christian, so therefore, I'm also a Christian. I'm Christian by birth. Are you sure? But it's not private. Take none of that. It's personal, but it's not private. Every individual must have a personal commitment to follow Christ. No one can decide it to you or for you. But after the decision is made, we can go it alone. Every one of us needs help. And that's why God created the church. It's a community of God's people where we receive God's help. And as a church, we cannot say, I, I, I can be by myself, even though I'm a member of the church. Remember, no one is an island. For sometimes we find ourselves discouraged, things aren't going well, life is beating us up. And when those times come, we need what? Encouragement. We need other people to come alongside of us and encourage us. That's true. Not all the time we are the encourager. There will come a time where we will be what? Discouraged. For sometimes we find ourselves being complacent. We lose enthusiasm in serving the Lord. And why do we lose enthusiasm? Because we channel our focus to something else. Just like the example that was given in the Bible study. Why is it that during Sunday, especially when the Dallas Cowboys are having a game, who are those people in the Dallas Cowboys game? They are what? They are the Christians themselves. Because they lose focus, their enthusiasm shifted from serving the Lord to, okay, I guess the Lord uh, will understand me. This is a very important game for the uh, Dallas Cowboys, so I'd like to be here. I'm a 100% supporter. <coughs> when that happens, we need someone to come alongside and challenge us to grow when we become complacent. Sometimes, okay, I just want to stay in the church, at least I'm going to church. I, I don't want to participate anymore. I just want to sit and I just observe. Don't be complacent. Don't lose enthusiasm in serving the Lord. Sometimes we can start to stray from the truth. We all have the tendency to trust our own wisdom rather than the wisdom that comes from God. It's true. We become an acne person. Do you know what an acne person is? The acronym AKNY, acne. No one knows what an acne person is, maybe except me. <laughs> Because it's in Tagalog. Acne means, alam ko na yan. Don't be like that. But whenever you, you hear something from your brothers or sisters, oh, alam ko na yan. Because you're an acne person. Because you, you have so much with you that you don't listen anymore. Alam ko na yan. Acne. It seems you know a lot, almost everything, and it times like it. Or like this, we need people who care about us in our spiritual future to give a warning to us. Otherwise, we will continue down the wrong path. And sometimes we'll rebel and willfully do something that is directly against what our Lord Jesus told us to do. And at times like that, we need a strong rebuke. We all need that. You may not realize it. But sometimes, the most loving thing a person can do for us is to get tough with us. If your spouse needs a strong review, give that review. If your children need a strong review, give that strong review. Or if your friend needs that strong review, give that. Because it will save them from a lot of unnecessary pain. That's true. That's the most loving thing sometimes that we can give to others. 
The bottom line is that we all need help, and God has given us that help through others. We should listen to them, we should follow them, we should honor them. We need to follow those who follow Christ, and all of us should strive to be someone worthy of following. And the last one is, the third point is recognize your enemies, found in verses 18 and 19. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. The third practical pointer is this, recognize your enemies. Let us understand this, brothers and sisters, as you seek to intentionally make your life count for the future, there will be those who will oppose you, whether in your workplace, whether your relatives. You not only have to recognize this, but you also have to prepare for it. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says that the cross, the symbol of death, penalty and atonement, love and forgiveness is going to be an offense to some. Yes or no? The cross. On the cross, Jesus laid down his life in payment for our sins. It is the way of sacrifice. It's the way of selflessness. But you see, in our society today, we live in a very self-centered society. Our society is focused on what makes us happy now. What makes you happy? That's what the society is promoting. The values of the cross are in many cases the exact opposite of the values of our modern society. So, brothers and sisters, won't be surprised if there are a lot of people who are dead set against Christianity. They are considered the enemies. They want to do nothing to be with Christianity or Christians. They hate Christians. That's why they are the enemies of God. They reject our commitment. They always look at us, finding at least that the littlest mistake that we can do, and then accuse us. But there are some who say they embrace the Christian faith. It could be uh, they are the people that Apostle Paul is referring to. They, they embrace the Christian faith, yet they pervert the Christian faith, meaning they teach false doctrines. They are also the enemies of God. They would never view themselves as enemies of the cross, but what they teach pervert, perverts the truth about the cross. Some teach that Christ's sacrifice is not enough. That's a false doctrine. But others say that it is what is recorded in the Bible is only symbol or a myth that's designed to inspire us and to lead lives that are good and noble. Again, another false doctrine. They subtract from the truth that the gospel is a living, resurrected person. Others deny that it's a human being's personal sin that separates him or her from the Holy God. They deny God's justice. They are the enemies of God. And Paul describes his people who pervert the gospel in interesting ways. Number one, their destiny is destruction. That means they're not really Christians at all. They may be religious and go to church, but being religious and going to church doesn't make someone a Christian. For many discovered many years of going to church, many discovered Oh, I'm not yet a Christian after going to more than 20 years of their life. It's just like when you're driving a car, does it make you a mechanic because you're driving a car? No. When you're wearing, for example, a, 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 an outfit, let's say, when you're wearing a soldier's outfit that makes you a soldier, no, that you're simply wearing it. Okay? So driving a car doesn't make you a mechanic. Wearing a, a, an outfit like a soldier, or let's say you're, you're wearing an outfit of a policeman, doesn't make you a policeman. So I won't wear my, my uh, jacket uh, NYPD <laughs> anymore. <laughs> because it doesn't make me a policeman. And I think I don't look like one. <laughs> Number two, their God is their stomach. The Greek word that's translated stomach is talking about the middle of a person. 
from the upper thigh to the chest area. It's referring to the place of our appetites. In other words, when we place our appetites as our priorities, they become our gods. That's true. No matter if it's food, it's recreation, or rest, or pleasure, or even sex. If any of those take priority over our relationship with God, they have become God to us. Third one, their glory is in their shame. In other words, they are proud of what they should be ashamed of. If you don't believe this is happening, and I, I don't know if you're watching this, just watch 15 minutes of Maury or Jerry Springer's TV show. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yes. Okay. People literally boast about lifestyles that are perverted and hedonistic. I was able to watch some of those episodes and uh, it was really shocking. Because those things are supposed, you should supposed to be ashamed of, but they are not ashamed and they are even proud of their accomplishments in life. Their glory is their shame. This is a direction our society is traveling. And their mind is on earthly things. And this is the bottom line for them. They are not interested in eternity. They are living for today. They are living by the philosophy that you only go around once and you have to, you have to grab for all the goods that you can get. For There's a philosophy that eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you will die. In the winter of 1984, Billy Graham spoke to thousands of students and Christian leaders who had gathered at the Urban Missionary Conference on the campus of the University of Illinois. His words from that conference have caused a lot of his listeners to examine their lives. And there is a powerful spiritual challenge in his words. What will you be like as Christian 10 years from now? Many will be walking with Christ and serving Him in various capacities around the world. But for others, there will be a tragedy, because 10 years from now, they will have lost their burning zeal and love for Christ. Not necessarily because they wanted to, or because they had set their heart in rebellion against God's will, but because they have set their life by going, or by the world's agenda. They set their life by the world's agenda. That agenda causes the power of Christ and the urgency of the Great Commission to gradually dim. The influence of Billy Graham when he talk about the world's agenda are the people Apostle Paul is talking about. Anyone who is not totally committed to following Jesus Christ is still thinks they're Christian. Paul says that one of the things they are is they're an enemy and we, we must be on our guard against any philosophy or any belief or any wisdom that doesn't center on Jesus, the cross, and the commitment to the words of the Bible. But not only are those who are not totally committed to following Jesus Christ, the enemies. If they're, if they're the enemies, aside from looking at them as the enemies, there should be looked upon as our mission field. Don't just consider these as enemies. Consider them as our mission field. What do we do with the enemy? Shoot them? Kill them? No, as a Christian. If, if we know they are the enemies, we should evangelize them. That's our mission field. Christians have been left on earth to tell people who are not Christians about Jesus. If we are not intentionally doing something that is designed to be a link in the chain of events, that will bring another person to faith in Christ, we're just taking up space, not leaving a legacy. To conclude, Paul says, leaving a legacy isn't anything close to rapid science. Or is it something reserved for the professionals in the church? In fact, you don't have to be rich like Alfred Nobel. You don't have to be perfect like Jesus to leave a legacy. You don't have to be smart like Apostle Paul to leave a legacy. You just have to follow three things. First, remember who we are in Christ. Remember what we have in Christ and live up to that. Refuse to live like you are nothing and have nothing. Hold your head up high because we are a child of God. 
second, follow those who follow Christ. The third thing that you're going to be like them, because become someone who encourages others and leads them to be more like Jesus. And third, recognize your enemies. Don't be discouraged by them. Even if they're going against you, don't be taken by them. Don't be shaken by them. Just understand them for who they are. People who need the Lord. People who need the good news about Jesus. What are people going to say about you 10 years from now? Just like what Billy Graham asked in that missionary conference. Will people be inspired by your life? Or will your life have meant nothing? Because you took your eyes off of Jesus and placed them in world of things. God's desire is that you invest your life and resources in a way that glorifies Him. To live a legacy that's far greater than material wealth because it has eternal significance. Brothers and sisters, a legacy doesn't just happen. It's something that is planned for and is something that is not.